finals, you know, you expect their best and, and we hope to um, counter that with our best. Um, we've watched all the games that we played against them in the regular season and they were highly competitive games. And, you know, every possession, the every possession mentality is going to be something that um, both teams are probably going to be locked into, but it's the final. Like it's the most competitive basketball you're going to see, and uh, we, we embrace that. All right, that does it then on this edition of We On Sports. We'll be back again at the same time tomorrow with more action from the Euros, the Copa America, Wimbledon, as well as the NBA. So do join me then. For now, it's goodbye.
many other uh, The question is right, uh, Arab. Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Simon Marks, and in this bulletin, we'll get you updates on stories developing around the world. Every year, the 4th of July brings celebrations across the United States. This year, too, there were parades, fireworks and celebrations. But the holiday weekend in some parts of the country was marred by violence. Data released by the American Gun Violence Archive shows there were over 400 shooting incidents that rocked the country over the weekend. We'll get you all the details on that grim story, but first, let's take a look at all the top headlines. The Taliban continues to make territorial advances in Afghanistan. According to American media reports, the terror group has taken over Afghanistan's main trade gateway into Tajikistan. It was built by the U.S. Wreckage of a Russian plane with 28 people aboard, which crashed in the country's far eastern Kamchatka Peninsula, has been recovered. Officials say there are no survivors. A former Belarusian presidential contender, opposition leader Viktor Babariko, is sentenced to 14 years in prison by a Belarus court. Babariko was arrested in June last year. The United States marks a bloody July 4th weekend. Data compiled by the Gun Violence Archive shows at least 150 people were killed in gun violence over, in, uh, in over 400 uh, different incidents during the Independence Day weekend. Hundreds of fires continue to burn across central British Columbia amid warnings of more lightning strikes and an unprecedented heat wave that has gripped the country. And the English cricket team is hit by a COVID-19 outbreak with three players and four members of the coaching staff testing positive. The world champions will field an entirely new squad for the ODI series against Pakistan with Ben Stokes named captain. As the first family enjoyed fireworks lighting the skies over the White House, on the 4th of July, the U.S. also witnessed an extraordinarily violent holiday weekend. 150 people were reportedly killed in over 400 separate shooting incidents during the Independence Day weekend. The American Gun Violence Archive says those 400 incidents occurred over a 72-hour period. However, the numbers might rise as fresh data continues to emerge. New York is seeing an unprecedented rise in crimes. 26 people were killed in 21 shootings there between Friday and Sunday. 13 victims were gunned down in 12 shooting in incidents on Independence Day itself, July the 4th. And New York has recorded a 40% increase in gun violence over a year ago. In Chicago, 83 people were wounded in several shootings. 14 of them died. Police Superintendent David Brown called it the most challenging weekend of the year. One of the victims of the shootings in Chicago was a member of the Illinois National Guard. However, Chicago has seen a 20% drop in its homicide rate this year. But shooting incidents have been on a constant rise across the United States. They've been occurring in states all over the country. Previously, Colorado, Georgia and Texas were rocked by a spate of gun violence. Numerous shooting incidents were reported from other inner cities, including Cincinnati and Dallas. U.S. President Joe Biden continues to press Congress to pass gun control legislation, but Congress lacks the appetite for the fight. 
As crime rates continue to surge unabated in the country, the president has clearly indicated his support for reforming gun laws. And he recently slammed illegal weapons sellers, calling them merchants of death. The department is announcing, as I just did, a major crackdown on to stem the flow of guns used to commit violent crimes. It's zero tolerance for gun dealers who willfully violate key existing laws and regulations. Let me repeat, zero tolerance. Some 200 wildfires are now raging across western Canada. Firefighters are racing against time to cure the infernos as the region recovers from a deadly heat wave. More than 135 wildfires have been reported in central British Columbia. Meteorologists are warning about the possibility of lightning strikes that could fuel further forest fires. Over 700,000 lightning strikes were reported across western Alberta and British Columbia. Local media reports that two-thirds of the wildfires are feared to have spiralled out of control. Canadian meteorologists say that lightning strikes grew by tenfold this year. During the season, the fires are likely to devour a hundred thousand hectares of land. Experts fear that high winds fueled by lightning could spike that number. Thousands have been evacuated from the province of British Columbia amid the deadly heat wave that gripped the northwest Pacific region. 719 people have lost their lives in Canada due to the sweltering heat. Temperatures in several areas inched closer to 50 degrees Celsius over the weekend. Scorching heat triggered a forest fire that raised the town of Lytton to the ground. This has been one of the worst incidents globally relating to climate change in recent times. Now, amidst a surge in violence and the withdrawal of international troops, the Taliban has said it will present a peace proposal to the Afghan government by next month. The announcement comes as the terrorist group continues to make territorial gains in the country. On Sunday, the Taliban's march through northern Afghanistan gained fresh momentum, forcing Afghan forces to flee. And as you'll see in this report, many of them headed across the border into neighbouring Tajikistan. The withdrawal of international troops from Afghanistan has emboldened the Taliban. For weeks now, the terrorist group has been making territorial gains, many of them outside its own strongholds. Although the Doha peace talks between Afghan government and Taliban negotiators failed to make a headway, Taliban now plans to present a written peace proposal to the Afghan government and the proposal could be sent as soon as next month. Taliban spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid told Reuters that the peace talks and process will be accelerated in the coming days and they're expected to enter an important stage. The latest round of talks come at a critical juncture. Taliban spokesperson added that the group is serious about dialogue. The reality on ground, however, reflects a different picture. Taliban has control over 200 districts in Afghanistan across 34 provinces. Speaking to British broadcaster Sky, a Taliban negotiator reaffirmed the terror group's commitment to durable peace. It is a negotiated settlement for Afghanistan. I see it, there should be negotiated settlement for the country because only in that case we can have a durable peace. It is our policy. Military approach will bring victory but not a durable peace. He added that the Taliban will not allow attacks on the US or its allies on Afghan territory. We have this agreement of Doha agreement, we have commitment that we will not allow anyone or any entity to use the soil of Afghanistan against the United States, its allies in other countries. The worsening crisis in Afghanistan has put its neighbor Tajikistan on high alert. Tajikistan has increased troop deployment and is bolstering its border with Afghanistan. 
This after hundreds of Afghan security force members fled to the neighboring country. Reports say over 300 Afghan soldiers crossed from the Afghanistan Badakhshan province as Taliban made advances. Tajikistan has also approached its allies, including Russia, for help. Russian President Vladimir Putin has assured assistance to the former Soviet nation. But the big question that stands is that will initiation of peace talks from Taliban change the ground reality in war-torn Afghanistan? Or will it be another sham proposal by the terror group? Bureau report, we on, world is one. Now we shift our focus to Russia, where 28 people have died after a passenger plane crashed in the far east of the country. The plane was en route from the regional capital of Kamchatka Krai to Palana, a village in the same federal district in the Russian east, when it lost contact with air traffic controllers. Russia's Civil Aviation Authority says the plane's wreckage was found at 9 p.m. local time. It added that the debris was from the airport's runway on the coastal side of that runway. However, they did not spe specify uh, whether the debris was found in the ocean itself. The emergencies ministry earlier dispatched a helicopter and deployed teams on the ground to look for the missing aircraft. Today, a disaster happened with the plane. The tragedy happened upon landing. Allegedly, the plane took a second lap due to low visibility. There were 22 passengers and six crew aboard that Russian passenger plane. The head of the local government in Palana, Olga Moskieva, was also on the flight. No one survived. Change of pace now. We're going to look at a fizzing dispute between Russia and France. They are at loggerheads over the issue of champagne. Our next report tells you why. Tensions between Moscow and French winemakers bubbled over on Monday when France's champagne industry group called on its members to halt all shipments of the fizzy beverage to Russia over a new law signed by Russian President Vladimir Putin that forces foreign champagne producers to add the words sparkling wine to their labels. The law requires all non-Russian producers of sparkling wine to describe their product as such on the back of every bottle, but Russian makers of champagne skoy may continue to use that term alone. In response, France's Champagne Wine Professionals Committee said all shipments to Russia should be halted for the time being, and said the name Champagne, which refers to the region in France the drink comes from, had legal protection in 120 countries. Charles Gomer is the committee's director general. It's tragic for the producers who are losing the legitimate right to use this name. It's also tragic for our business with Russia because, at least temporarily, Champagne wines will no longer be able to be exported to Russia because they no longer conform with the rules. The Champagne Committee also called on French and European Union diplomats to get the law changed. Meanwhile, Moet Hennessy, the maker of Dom Perignon, said on Sunday that it would comply with the law and begin adding the word sparkling wine to the back of bottles destined for Russia. A Belarusian court has sentenced former presidential contender Viktor Babariko to 14 years in prison on corruption charges. The development marks another harsh move by the Belarusian authorities to quash dissent against President Alexander Lukashenko. Barbarico's legal team say the charges against their client were fabricated to doom his political ambitions. Barbarico is the former head of the Russian-owned Bell Gazprom Bank. He was arrested last June when he was trying to register as a candidate to run against Lukashenko in the presidential vote that critics subsequently claimed was rigged in the president's favor. Lukashenko, who has been in power since 1994, denies any kind of electoral fraud. 
Since Lukashenko's win in the presidential election, the government has come up with various measures to stifle opposition voices and prevent them from gaining strength. His former ally, Maria Kolesnikova, has also been jailed in Belarus. And opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya is in self-imposed exile in neighboring Lithuania. Belarusian authorities have cracked down on anti-government protests that erupted in the wake of the disputed election, prompting a series of Western sanctions against the former Soviet nation. Protesters with rainbow flags hit the streets in multiple cities across Spain. People expressing anger over the death of a man in a suspected homophobic attack in the north of the country. Here's our report on that. Waving the rainbow flag, thousands of protesters spilled onto the streets of several cities across Spain on Monday. Angry over the death of a man in what was suspected to be a homophobic attack. A 24-year-old nursing assistant was beaten near a nightclub during the early hours of Saturday morning in the northern port city of A Coruña. Local news reported that the attacker was heard shouting homophobic slurs at the man, who later died in hospital. Radan Avado joined the protests in Barcelona. The country still does not really accept that there are many ways to love and different ways to love. It cannot be possible that because a person decides to live his life loving a person of the same gender or loving whoever, he ends up losing his life. A local government representative tweeted that police were investigating and local media quoted him saying the investigation would show whether or not the attack was motivated by homophobia. In 2019 alone, 278 hate crimes related to sexual orientation or gender identity were reported in Spain, an increase from the year before. Rights groups have warned that the crimes are still underreported. There's been another shocking incident of child kidnapping in Nigeria. Armed men stormed a boarding school in the state of Kaduna and abducted around 150 children. As you'll see in this report, this is the 10th mass school kidnapping in Nigeria in the last six months. <laughs> About 150 students were missing on Monday after armed men raided a boarding school in Nigeria's Kaduna state the latest in a wave of mass kidnappings targeting school children for ransom. Police said they were in hot pursuit alongside military personnel. The attack on the Bethel Baptist High School is the 10th mass school abduction since December in northwest Nigeria. Parent John Evans said he had recently told his daughter that God would protect her while she studied at the school. My daughter told me that day I don't like this school. Remember me in this school. I said, Daddy, I said, well, baby, we are starting an exam on Monday. And I'm told by Friday you'll be vacated. So just be patient. Just this morning, at about 6, I received a phone call that they have entered the school, kidnappers, and all our children are back, including my daughter inside. We will rush down here. We confirm that they are all back. Dozens of distraught parents gathered at the school compound, some weeping and crying out, standing in groups awaiting news. Police said gunmen shooting wildly attacked overnight and overpowered the school's security guards, taking an unspecified number of students into a nearby forest. A police statement said 26 people, including a female teacher, had been rescued. Armed men, known locally as bandits, have made an industry of kidnapping students for ransom in northwest Nigeria, with Kaduna State particularly hard hit. They have taken nearly 1,000 people from schools in the last eight months, more than 150 of whom remain missing. Now it's a dream come true for Iranian sprinter Farzana Fashia. She has qualified for the women's 100 metres at the Tokyo Olympics under the universality quota. That's the quota allowing one female and one male participant each from a number of countries to participate in the Olympics provided no other athlete from the same gender has met the qualification criteria. Here's a report.
واقعاً که مثل خواب بود واسم. It was like a dream for me. I felt like I was dreaming. I felt like I hadn't woken up yet. I was shocked. The feeling is indescribable and I truly wish every girl who is trying for this to be able to experience this feeling one day. My family had tears of joy. The day I got the news I was at my parents' house with my husband, they all cried with me. I'm the first female Iranian legionnaire who could race and be a part of European clubs. I'm the first person in 57 years who's going to the Olympics and will be doing the 100 meter sprint and this is truly an honor for me. Now, despite worries about the Delta variant, which is, of course, spreading rapidly across Europe, the 74th Cannes Film Festival is getting underway today with a glamorous lineup of guests and an extensive mix of films in competition with one another. The festival is especially important this year because the cinema industry is getting back on its feet after COVID-induced lockdowns and safety measures. Members of the 2021 jury, led by Malcolm X director Spike Lee and comprising mostly women, arrived in Cannes ahead of the opening festivities for the 74th edition of the film festival. Making history as the first African-American jury president, Spike Lee heads the judging panel, with help from eight jurors of seven different nationalities. Five women make up this year's jury, including French singer Mylene Farmer and actresses Maggie Gyllenhaal and Melanie Lawrence. The 2021 jury also includes French actor Taha Rahim, known for his role in Jacques Adariad's The Prophet and South Korean actor Song Kang-ho, one of the stars of Parasite, which won the coveted Palme d'Or in 2019. Cannes Film Festival Delegate General Thierry Fremont met with the media on the eve of the opening of the festival's first edition in two years, after it was cancelled in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Cannes, the world's biggest cinema showcase, has long been at odds with streaming companies as it insists on a theatrical release in France for any film selected to compete for its top film award. Unlike Cannes, some other film festivals, including Venice, have included films made by streaming giants in their main competition lineups without imposing such stringent demands. 2020 was the most catastrophic year in the history of filmmaking. Never have so many cinemas been closed all over the world. That, too, for such a long time. And for the streaming platforms, it was an absolute victory. A deserved victory, because they did extraordinary work at a time when cinema could not defend itself. At Cannes, we have used a rule that films in competition must be screened in French cinemas. It's not a very difficult rule, but Netflix did not want to follow it. They did not want to participate out of competition either. The Cannes Film Festival normally consists of a hectic 12 days of screenings, late night parties, press conferences and star spotting along the Femme Croisette waterfront. This year, as visitors trickle back to the city shoreline, it may not be business as usual, but it will still be a boost for the French city and for the cinema business as a whole. Bureau Report, we on World is One. The industry may be changing, but can stays the same. That's all we have on this edition of We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Simon Marks. For more global news and updates, stay tuned to We On. World is One.
many other. Uh, this is right, uh, Arab. 